can a painting like this tell the story of defiance and pioneer a new way of thinking? The defiance in its simplicity, the lack of figure, what context precedes the composition and rhythm of these three perfect circles? This is the 1951 painting Formas by Ivan Serpa, the leading pioneer of the concrete art movement in Brazil. As one of the leaders of El Grupo Frente, Serpa led a new group of abstract Brazilian artists who were eager to bring a new perspective to the table. Studying with printmaker Axel Leskacek and mentored by art critic Mario Pedrosa, he had technically never received any formal art training. Despite this, he went on to have an extensive teaching career and to be considered a national treasure of Brazil. But what built him up to reach this point? When new perspectives and styles of abstraction are brought into the art world, who are the people that are able to, and not able, to receive credit for it? Our series, Formas, entangles the power struggle that has plagued how we read abstract art by examining it through the lenses of identity, design, and etc. Abstract art is historically the white man's narrative. Europe was considered the height of the art world, weaponizing its geopolitical power to define how we perceive the value of art. This inequality of power corrupts the abstraction's timeline, filtering who is included and excluded in the canon through the lens of whiteness. Really, it's more complex than that. As we attempt to decolonize the way we perceive art and unlearn to only perceive artists who fit the physical mold, we open the canon to welcome artists who should have been recognized long ago. Who was allowed to succeed? How many artists didn't fit the mold and were then forgotten about? When we practice reshaping our collective canon, who else may come to light? Today, we're going to start off our episode with our first artist, Carmen Herrera. She also very sadly died recently in February of this year at 106 years old and she was even painting up until then. She was born in 1915 Havana, Cuba, where from a young age she was trained in the arts. She studied in Paris at 14 and later returned to Cuba in 1938 to study architecture at the University of Havana. However, because of constant revolutions and fighting in the streets, the university was always closed and she could actually not finish her studies. This year was extremely impactful for her and she was quoted saying, there, an extraordinary world opened up to me that never closed. The world of straight lines, which has interested me until this very day. And over the long course of her artistic career, her work stayed remarkably consistent, painting these strong, abstract, geometric shapes. This painting on the left, Blanco y Verde, is by far her most famous piece that gets international recognition for how it alludes to infinity, which is two green shapes. In 1954, she permanently moved to New York and continued to paint in basically complete obscurity, unacknowledged for over five decades and living off of the support of her husband, who was a high school English teacher. Carmen talked about experiences of going into galleries and being told to her face that despite the fact that she could paint circles around the male painters, despite her great talent, she could not get a show because of her gender as well as her Cuban heritage. It was not until 2004, at the age of 89, she sold her first painting and her career changed forever. She went from nothing to having her first solo show at the Whitney at 101 years old, other shows and galleries throughout the world, suddenly becoming known as this incredible, undiscovered treasure of the art world. Now, suddenly everyone wanted to exhibit her work and buy her paintings. Of course, this is amazing that she is now recognized for her work as it's very well deserved. But it also does raise some suspicion at the same time, especially because of how fast it all happened. Maybe is this the fine art world and its corruption trying to compensate for excluding this female Latina painter for decades? Now they're making this big show of her, all these retrospectives of her work that nobody was paying attention to at the actual time that she was producing them. Even if this is the case though, Carmen was always very adamant about not wanting to be labeled as anything but just a painter. Before selling her first painting, she was able to show in a couple small exhibitions in New York, but only ones that had a Latin American focus. And in a later quote, she said that she felt terrible about it. Quote, I don't want to be a Latin American painter or a woman painter. I'm a painter. Even though she lived in the U.S. for the majority of her life, when she was discovered, all these publications were writing about her discovery, labeling her as a Cuban-American artist. 
Of course, she was always proud of her heritage, but she consciously avoided ever relating her work to a specific national or ethnic aesthetic or politicizing it, which is something that I really admire personally. I feel like that takes a lot of courage and oftentimes as artists, we need to find the things we can use to differentiate ourselves and hang on to it. But Carmen always kind of refused to do that and instead just let the work speak for itself. Another thing many people also theorize is that her art is defiantly masculine, which is something that draws me to her a lot. For example, if you saw these paintings without knowing who made them, would you think that a man painted them? And then after finding out that a woman painted them, does that throw some people off? Because it's also interesting to think about her stuff in relation to the corruption of the female artist. This is not art that is seen as traditionally female. It's not delicate, it's not flowers or portraiture. It's confident, strong, geometric shapes. And with the visual language so strong, I believe this is what has allowed her work to effortlessly transcend through the decades. Hilma Afklemt was a revolutionary abstract artist and mystic born in Sweden in 1862. She was trained at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts. In the 1870s, she began to attend seances to contact the dead shortly after the unexpected death of her sister. In 1896, she and four other artists created De Femme, The Five, where they held seances to contact the high masters from other dimensions that highly influenced her work. She covered works based on spirituality and mysticism, finding her works to be tied to accessing a higher consciousness. Her work is considered to be the first known works of abstract art, predating Kandinsky and Mondrian, who are considered to be the fathers of abstraction. She was an artist way before her time. In her will, she specifically requested that her work not be shared until 20 years after her passing, as she knew the world would not be ready to receive them until then. Hilma Off Klimt's breakthrough came in 1986, a hundred years after her career. She is now only recognized as a pioneer of abstract art. When Helena Dreischa, a German filmmaker, contacted MoMA to find out why Off Klimt had been erased from art history, they were told they weren't so sure why Hilma Off Klimt's work worked as abstract art. After all, she hadn't exhibited in her lifetime, so how could one tell? In the film, Dragsha tries to answer that question by juxtaposing paintings by Off Klimt with those of 20th century male artists. Her works are put alongside Joseph Albers and Cy Twombly. They make the point strongly. Whatever the men were doing, Off Klimt had probably done it first. Dragsha then interjects that it is easier to make a woman into a crazy witch than change art history to accommodate her we still see a woman who is spiritual as a witch while we celebrate spiritual male artists as geniuses off Klimt didn't want her works to sell as stated in her will which was likely played a factor in in why she was recognized so far past her death if she was to be recognized as a pioneer of abstract art so many abstract works that were worth millions at auctions would lose their mystique of their quote-unquote pioneer If dealers were to downplay her role, it would be better for them economically. It also begs the question of how many other visionaries' works have been kept from the world as to not disturb the sensibilities of bidding for the 1%. In all, Off Klimt is a compelling case of the corruption in the abstract art canon. Her name was scraped from history to uphold a bias system to keep those with power in power. Howardina Pindell is another artist whose work challenges the abstract canon. Originally from Philadelphia, Pindell is an arts educator and curator who made work in her free time. Her paintings are full of color and texture, with a mix of media concealing strips of canvas that she has woven together. It was after moving to New York that she focused on collaging different materials from her everyday life into abstract compositions, layering hole-punched cardstock reminiscent of her office job, talcum powder, sewing thread, glitter, perfume, and even cat hair in her pieces. The Air Gallery, which she co-founded in 1972, was New York's first all-women direct artist-directed gallery. At Air, Pindell had the opportunity to show her work in a space that was more accepting of her vision and aesthetics. The feminine-coded materials of her work 
differentiated her paintings from the geometric, non-decorative abstraction of the famous white men of abstraction. Despite having a body of work that clearly contrasted the norm, the Studio Museum in Harlem turned her down, telling her to go downtown and show with the white boys. At the time, black artists who made abstract art that didn't seem to confront the tastes of their oppressors were frowned upon by their peers in the black arts movement. The movement often distinguished itself by using explicitly political symbolism and imagery, and many saw Pendel's work as abiding by the status quo. In Sarah Louise Cohen's article, Texturing Abstraction, Cohen argues that Pendel's use of texture is a conscious and unconscious reference to the African art which Pendel was inspired by from her travels around the continent. Despite lacking representational imagery, Pendel's paintings can be considered a document of her lived experience, incorporating materials from daily life and themes of femininity, ancestry, and memory. These elements obscuring her woven canvases corrupts and decenters the logic of the grid, a foundational element of abstract art. Her abstraction is personal, joyful, and meaningful in a way that defied expectations of what her work should look like and achieve.